Are you interested in the kingdom of God? If the spirit of God dwells within you, you will be most interested in the kingdom of God. And if you're interested in the kingdom, then you're also going to be interested in prophecy, especially prophecy that relates to the last days, the end times. And a great place to learn about the last days is the book of Revelation. When one studies the book of Revelation, not only will they be blessed because the word of God promises that, but also we're going to encounter a very unique group of individuals. And of course, I'm speaking about the 144,000. In this edition of our series, Revelation Shorts, we're going to study biblically what the scripture says about the 144,000. Now, the first thing that I want to point out is that this group, by name, meaning that number of 144,000, that group only appears in the book of Revelation. And they only appear twice, in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14. Now, I would encourage you to have your Bible in your hand. And as I go through Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, and I'm going to do so very quickly and briefly, you'll want to be looking at the text. You're going to want to read it, perhaps, before you watch any more of this video. And you're certainly going to want to read it and reread these two chapters afterwards to check what I'm saying. Am I speaking accurately what the Word of God shares? This is my desire. And again, the revelation of John in this book called Revelation, he sees this 144,000 in only chapters 7 and 14. Now, before we get started, as a way of some introductory remarks, let me point out something to you. And that is that in Revelation chapter 21, we speak about the new Jerusalem. See, we need to be wise. We need to be scripturally sound. We are not going to spend eternity in heaven. If someone says that, they are mistaken because Messiah said something. He says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth is going to pass away. Now, when we talk about heaven and earth, we're talking about creation. And that means there's going to be a new creation. And that new heaven and earth, that new creation, has a name. It's called the New Jerusalem. And when we look at that kingdom, the final and eternal state, the final and eternal state of the kingdom of God, we see that the number 144 or 144,000 figures in a prominent way. When we deal with the size of the New Jerusalem, that concept of 144,000 appears. And also, when we speak about the walls of the New Jerusalem, the scripture tells us emphatically that they are 144 cubits. So again, the number 144, whether it's 144 or 144,000, we see that it's a kingdom number. It has kingdom connections. And of course, we get 144 because of the number 12. 12 times 12 or 12,000 times 12. So 12 is also a kingdom number having kingdom significance, but in the full sense, 144, whether it's 1,000 or 144 alone. It's a kingdom number. Now, we know that this group in Revelation chapter 7, this 144,000, 
they are going to be sealed and their sealing happens before the wrath of God falls. How can we be so sure? Well, let's just take exactly what the scripture reveals. If you look at the previous chapter, chapter 6, we find that there are seals. And the last seal in Revelation chapter 6 is the sixth seal. And what is that? In that sixth seal, we find that the wrath of the Lamb is mentioned. And it says that it's coming, that it's near, so near, that if you read that last part of chapter 6, you find individuals, all individuals, running from the wrath of God. Those are the ones who are not believers, who have not been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They are fleeing and taking shelter in mountains, under rocks and such, because the wrath of the Lamb is approaching. But when we get to Revelation chapter 7, there's a proclamation. What is that proclamation? Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees. So don't harm the earth until the sealing of the servants of God. So let's point out one very important point, and that is this 144,000, whoever it may be, they are called in Revelation 7, the servants of God. Now, the scholars tell us that a servant of God becomes a servant because God has called them. They have a calling to serve God, meaning God wants to use them. And we know that God wants to use Israel. Israel is God's chosen vessel in order to bring blessing, a kingdom blessing, into this world. So let's review this group of 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 7. They are sealed upon their forehead with the seal of the living God. And we know that there's someone else that figures prominently in this, and that is the nation of Israel because this 144,000, they are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So when we look at Revelation chapter 7, it is Israel that figures in prominently. It is Israel, the 12 tribes that are connected to the 144,000. Is that going to be the case when we look at chapter 14 and the 144,000 mentioned there? We'll look and see. But for right now, limiting our remarks to Revelation chapter 7, there's just a few points that we make. That this group of 144,000 they are connected to Israel, the 12 tribes. They are called the servants of God, and they're sealed with the seal of God prior to the wrath of God falling. That proclamation, don't harm the earth until the 144,000 are sealed upon their foreheads. Now, there's one last point that needs to be brought up because so often people will ask this question, and that is, why is it that the tribe of Dan is not mentioned? Now, we're not told why, but because I know that's upon everyone's mind, let me just respond in a very safe way, and that's this. We know that when the children of Israel were called to take possession to inherit the land of Canaan. That Dan, he was assigned that area of land by the Mediterranean coast where the Philistines were a very strong people. And he didn't like that. And ultimately, Dan decided not to take possession of that land, but to go further north. And what we're told prophetically is that he forsook 
his inheritance. So many scholars point out that it was because that he forsook the inheritance, because there's a connection between the land of Israel and the kingdom of God. It's a paradigm, it's a pattern. Because he forsook his earthly inheritance, he has no kingdom inheritance. Here again, that is speculation, but with a biblical basis for it. Now, the next thing we see is that Don's not mentioned, but it's the oldest son of Joseph, the one called Manasseh. He's mentioned instead of Don. He was the one that we see that was blessed by, by their grandfather, the father of Joseph, Jacob, and that unique blessing at the end of the book of Genesis. It was initially his younger brother, Ephraim, that got the preferred, but now there's going to be a change. See, with the kingdom of God, everything changes. And now it's not Ephraim, but it's Manasseh that has a place of prominence, as he's mentioned within those 12 tribes, having to do with the 144,000. So I think you would have to agree that if you read all of Revelation chapter 7, that's what we're told about the 144,000, that they're sealed upon their foreheads with the seal of God, that they are servants of God. They have a connection to Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. That's all we're told. But when we get to chapter 14, and let's turn our attention to that now, you may want to flip to that, cha uh, that chapter, Revelation chapter 14, and we see there's great differences. What we were told in chapter 7 really did not, uh, are not, is not revisited in chapter 14, but everything is different, for example. In Revelation 14, we find that it's not Israel that is prominently mentioned, that this 144,000 has a connection to, but rather, who figures in a very large manner in Revelation 14 in regard to the 144,000 is the Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. He is prominent. And we're told that this 144,000, they are with him, where? Standing on Mount Zion, Har Sion. Now, Mount Zion is a kingdom term. Why? Well, normally, and this is what the scholars teach, is that Jerusalem and Zion were speaking about the same place, but in a different condition. Sion or Zion is Jerusalem, but Jerusalem in a redemptive state. When I say redemptive state, that is in a kingdom state. And we're going to see in chapter 14 something that's different. Remember in chapter 7, that 144,000, they were sealed while they were on earth for the purpose of being here when the wrath of God falls. But when we look now at the 144,000 in chapter 14, we see that not only is Sion, Zion mentioned, which is a kingdom term, but there's going to be an emphasis upon heaven. And this is so important. Not upon earth, but upon heaven. Now, where does that come from? Well, if you read carefully in the first few verses, there's going to be harpists playing. There's harp music. And normally we associate that with the music of heaven. And to strengthen that, we find that there's a new song that's going to be sung. And only the 144,000, only they can learn and sing that is worship in this way. Now, a new song, we know that there are psalms that sing a new song. And the new song is a kingdom song. 
It's not of this world, but it's a heavenly song, a kingdom song. And this idea of heaven is supported because what's mentioned next, if you read carefully, you're going to find that this group no longer is in Zion, that is in the Jerusalem, that land, that location that, that exists today. But suddenly there's a change, a very significant change. And we see that what figures in a very significant way is the throne, the throne of God. Now, this is before Messiah's second coming. And we know when he comes the second time, he's coming all the way to the Mount of Olives, and he'll go down the Mount of Olives, cross over the Kidron Valley, go through the Eastern Gate, and he will inaugurate, that is, he will dedicate and begin the Millennial Kingdom. We're not talking about this time. We're talking about something that is prior to this event. And what we find here is prior to Messiah's second coming, the throne of God is where? It's in the heaven. And that's why the throne is mentioned and to help the reader understand that we're talking about heaven and not earth. Notice who's mentioned. We find that there are the four creatures. Where are those four creatures? Before the throne. What do they do? Worship God all the time. And not only are there the four creatures, but there's also the elders. And in the book of Revelation, and check this out, they're mentioned several times, and they're always doing something, these elders. They're always in heaven. They are always close to the throne, and they're falling down and worshiping God. So when we put that all together, harp, we find a new song, the throne, the four creatures, and the elders. All of this is to inform the reader that these 144,000, they're literally in heaven. There's something else. If you look at the scripture in Revelation 14, you'll find that this 144,000, they are called by, by John, that they are called virgins. They have not been defiled with women. Now, we need to understand this prophetically. In fact, you cannot understand the book of Revelation unless you understand prophecy. Now, prophecy, whether we're talking about Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or the minor prophets, what we find is when the scripture speaks through prophecy about defilement, about that which is unholy, we see that it's referring to adultery, but not a physical adultery, but a spiritual adultery, meaning idolatry. If you read the prophets, you will see when they speak of adultery, they're actually speaking about idolatry. And notice what the scripture says. This group of 144,000, they had not been defiled with women. Now here's, and it says that they're virgins. So people misunderstand that. They'll say they've never been married. They're virgins. But let me ask you a question. Does marriage, if it's a godly marriage, a covenantal marriage, when a man is with his wife in an intimate way, does that defile him? Does that render him unholy? It does not. God commands. He says it's not good for man to be alone. So marriage is a wonderful covenantal relationship. And that intimacy between a husband and wife within the covenantal agreement is a wonderful happening. It is not that which brings defilement. God oftentimes blesses that, and a child is the result. So it's not defilement. And when we speak about virgins, we're speaking about those. Notice what's said immediately thereafter. See, the problem is people don't pay attention to the clues of Scripture. It says that they are virgins. They've never been defiled, meaning they've never been 
idol worshipers. Why? The next thing it says, that they follow after the lamb. And again, the lamb figures prominently with this group. He's not mentioned with the first 144,000. They are connected in a unique way to the 12 tribes, to Israel. But in Revelation 14, this group of 144,000, there's nothing mentioned about Israel. It's always the lamb he's mentioned several times. And this group that's not defiled, meaning they're not participating in idolatry. They are spiritually virgins. They are true to Messiah. Why? It says they follow him wherever he goes. Such an important clue to help us understand rightly the intent of no defilement and virgins. They are faithful to the Lamb, and we're told that this group is redeemed. We're never told that about the 144,000 in chapter 7. But chapter 14, they are redeemed, and they are the first fruits before the throne of God, and they are redeemed and the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Again, over and over, the Lamb is mentioned. And again, this 144,000, finally we're told, they too are before the throne of God, which at that time is still in the heavens. So we have two groups. We're beginning to answer the question. One group is going to be on the earth. The other group, in Revelation 14, that group is in the heaven. They are worshiping God. Now, there's something else that I always hear when people talk about the 144,000, and that is they are, eva they are evangelists, and they are going to bring about this great revival in the last days. Well, I'm sorry, but we don't see that scripturally. We're never told ever that the 144,000 are evangelists. This is inferred and inferred incorrectly. What we're told, look now, if you're following along in Revelation 14, look at verse 6. This is what we're told. We're told that there's an angel, not the 144,000, but the angel that proclaims the gospel. He proclaims it. And here's what's interesting. He does so in a good place for us to learn how Scripture helps us interpret Scripture is if we go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Because there it says, and Messiah is teaching, and he says in that passage, Matthew 24, verse 14, he says that the everlasting gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed as a testimony to all nations, then the end will come. What end are we talking about? The end of the church age, which is with the rapture. So I would suggest to you, and let's draw some things together, and that is that when we look at the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7, we're speaking about Israel, 12 tribes those from Israel who are going to be in the kingdom of God. But when we come to Revelation 14 and that 144,000, the scripture tells us, read it for yourself, pay attention to the clues. They are individuals that are in heaven already. How did they get there? Well, the angel proclaimed, and then the end came, and they were taken up in that blessed event, that blessed hope, the rapture. Now, after Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, we see something. We see primarily there is going to be reaping and harvesting. And there's two reapings. Why two reapings? Well, Messiah does the first one. He stretches out his sickle and he reaps the earth. And who does he reap? His followers. He removes them. Why? Prior to the wrath of God falling. The first group in Revelation chapter 7, they will be here 
for the wrath of God. They are sealed because of the wrath of God, so that the wrath of God does not harm them. But the second group, they are going to be harvested. They are going to be taken out prior to, before the wrath of God falls. And then after this removal of the first group, we find that there's a special angel, and he takes his sickle, and he also reaps the earth. But here, he reaps those who are opposed to, to the gospel, those who reject God's, God's mercy, God's grace. That group that he harvests is that angel after Messiah takes out the believers. That group is going to be put into the wine press where the grapes of God's wrath is going to be trampled out. And therefore, we see another perfect example that the rapture happens before the wrath of God comes. Let me just simply say this, that 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7, they're going to have a kingdom connection. Why? Because elsewhere in the prophecy, it tells us at the end of God's wrath, Messiah is going to come. He's going to be revealed. They will look, that 144,000, I believe that it's a, a kingdom number, and it speaks about a remnant of Israel, that, that, that third of the children of Israel that are still alive, that came through this time known as Jacob's trouble, that were still alive. They are going to see Messiah, and they're going to accept this one who has been pierced, receive the gospel. So let me just conclude by saying this. The group in Revelation chapter 7 and the group in Revelation chapter 14, that 144,000, are two distinct groups. They both have a kingdom connection. Secondly, that number 144,000 is a kingdom number, not a literal number. There's going to be more that's raptured out than 144,000. And there's going to be more Jews that are saved that one third of Israel in the last days is going to be larger than 144,000. That number 144, as we're taught later on in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, it is a kingdom number. I believe that when you do thorough study of these two chapters, paying attention to all the biblical clues and understanding them prophetically what the Old Testament reveals about these things, you are also going to come away with the conclusion that I've shared with you. Two different groups, but they're both kingdom people. There's going to be those from Israel, those 12 tribes that are going to be redeemed when they see Messiah's second coming and look upon him that has been pierced. They're going to come to faith like Thomas came to faith. But there's also going to be the believers, the believers that are going to be taken out prior to God's wrath, prior to the second coming. And that removal is going to be done by Messiah himself harvesting up his disciples in the last days. And the disciples who are before him, there's going to be a great reunion at that harvest. Well, I hope this assists you and at least might help you and guide you as you do your own study of these two chapters, Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, being prayerful and coming to the conclusions that God leads you to come to. Until our next episode, may God bless you. Shalom from Israel.